The 2015 Need for Speed reboot has always been that one entry I've always looked through rose tinted glasses. I still vividly remember seeing the reveal trailer, the E3 showcases and being unbearably excited about a new game that looks so visually stunning. Even the cutscenes fooled me into thinking they were all an engine until I read about them online and discovered it was just live action. While not playing it at launch, I eventually got a copy offered by my cousin in 2017 and we both played it throughout the weekend passing the controller and just vibing out, but we never ended up finishing the game. Eight years later, leading up to today, I'm playing Need for Speed Unbound, which I'll talk about it someday, and I'm getting really fed up with the progression and the gratuitous grind that takes so long to accomplish stuff, so I took a break and decided to revisit the current reboot timeline that started with 2015. I've messed around with all of them but never delved deeply into them just due to being busy with other stuff. But I want to change that by first starting with 2015 and lucky me, my save data is still intact, saving me the hassle of replaying what amounted to 48% of the game done. And so off I went to become the ultimate icon and even get the platinum trophy. But it's pretty safe to say that I've come out a different man after this, a disappointed and frustrated one. Under all the mess, when 2015 clicks, it becomes both engaging, immersive and engrossing, thanks to the striking art direction and visual fidelity of its time, and the exhilarating races that have just the right amount of difficulty tuning to apply pressure, but when it doesn't, the bucket falls, revealing a deeply flawed and frustrating experience, where it feels as if the game struggles to get the fundamentals right while hiding all of its weaknesses under pretty bells and whistles. Oh, just all up. Relax, relax, relax. Luke, you went on probation. I'm out. Baby! <laughs> Let's start with a positive. The art direction of this entry is sublime, and while yes, everything under rain looks cool, it would be dismissive to ignore the copious amounts of post-processing and attention to detail used to really sell this filmic look that years later still impresses, from water drops on the car surface, the HUD complementing the simplicity of modern car dashboards, the effect of rain droplets in the HUD when the police light bar approaches closely, the use of bloom, lighting and depth of field to sell this very arresting and dangerous vibe under this encompassing usage of film grain. I'm generally not a fan of film grain in games and I prefer to turn it off every chance I have, but when it's used with this intent, I can appreciate its inclusion. I'm somewhat disappointed there's no daytime in the game, as I feel it would have complemented well too, but it's not a deal breaker. As much as I love it though, this achievement comes at the cost of visibility when cruising at high speeds. One thing I'm really appreciative of the newer Need for Speed games is how big and obvious the checkpoint borders are used to keep you on track. It might not be realistic or as immersive in the way the Forza Horizon games do them for example, but it helps you stick to the main path more easily, and it's a nice evolution of the invisible walls with big arrows pointing you in the right direction for many past racing games. I honestly can't tell you how many times I've crashed simply for not being able to see a tight corner in the distance, or how the obvious blue guiding line was hard to see at times because of the heavy post-processing. And speaking of the guiding line, while it does its job, it feels like it robs your attention from looking at your surroundings and determining the best timing for turns for the same visibility reasons. These are just some minor issues however, as there are much more fundamental design issues that hurt the core experience from my point of view. I'm gonna head back to the shop. Uh, you wanna tag along? We can set you up some space. Ooh, she gonna spiff you up, bruh. One design decision I'm actually a fan of is this game's progression system. You're this new guy who gets recruited into a ragtag team who's trying to be noticed by the five icons of racing, with each representing a style of driving like sprint, drift or build, and the game has you progressing by completing certain tasks that meet the requirement under the storyline of each category. It's a much more simple and straightforward way than EAT and Unbound's day and night cycles, and I really love being able to just approach a race and not having to worry about the extra pressure those games mentioned bring. Not that it's a bad thing by the way. I also do love how much more limited the selection of cars is and how many you can own them in your garage compared to other entries. This might have been due to development challenges, but the idea of having at maximum 10 cars in your warehouse seems to imply that the game encourages less car collecting and more using that limitation to make unique builds and fully master the car in your possession. 
For example, I'll always have a Toyota A86 in any game that has one in my garage because I'm simply an initial D fanboy. And two more extra cars specifically built for grip and drifting. If you don't have any money for parts, you can just sell one of the additional cars you're not using, like I did, with the added bonus of the upgraded components spent on that vehicle also counting towards the final price, so you can make use of it in your dream build. The body customization is also pretty limited, and it's disappointing some types never made an appearance such as rim and underbody neon lights, which would have undoubtedly complemented well with the art direction. With that out of the way, my actual problem with the gameplay stems from a larger fundamental issue the game unfortunately has design-wise, and it has to do with the handling model, which is something I'm very mixed about, because there are some positives and negatives that balance each other out to ultimately give me a very meh outlook on it. I don't hate it outright, nor do I like it, and it mostly has to do with the more simplified approach to the grip versus drift tuning. Grip, for example, handles pretty well and I never had a big issue controlling cars under this configuration. The problem is that most of the mission design in this game favors drifting, even in races that have little to do with it, it's still featured, and on the higher difficulty races, they'll start implementing more hard turns in your route, and while I don't mind drifting in this game, sometimes it feels too much, and the added rubber banding from the races on the higher difficulties do not help as well in particular races, more specifically, some of the drifting competitions, like Remastered for example, as you're prone to crash more and lose your points with ease. Drift tuning behaves as it should, and it feels as though the game was intentionally designed to be played this way. The only annoying part is when your car starts to oversteer and you lose control pretty frequently, even with assistance turned on. It's more aggravating in high stake races when a single oversteer can cost you a 9 minute run. At the end of the day it all comes to how you tune your car obviously, but even then, you'll have small moments where it's either easier to lose control of your car with a really balanced drift setup, or harder to turn in hard corners when you have a mix of drift and grip setup like grip tuning with drift specific tires. It's not a flawed way of approaching tuning, as experimentation is somewhat encouraged, but the balancing falls through thanks to said mishandling of the handling model. The collision model is also very inconsistent. I've had moments where a tap while driving at a moderate speed automatically caused a crash, which should be how it works, but there are also moments where driving at higher speeds and hitting other racers does not result in a crash, but if you're still carrying that momentum but at a much more reduced speed and suddenly shift into any other direction that happens to have a wall or another vehicle, it immediately results in a crash, which is really infuriating when you also pair the handling model that can easily screw you up for good and make you go to the garage and retune it as if you were playing Armor Core, but this time around you don't see any change unless you slow down when you feel like you're about to crash, and don't know if you're just speeding past it would be beneficial or not, which is counterintuitive to some of the missions that require you to drive fast, but I digress. The police system is also the weakest aspect of this game, and it's very apparent when you do the Outlaw storyline, where you get to stop and see the contrast in just how weakly designed they are. When you have cops on your tail, they'll hardly attempt to chase you unless you're matching their speed, they barely pressure you, and the higher the heat you get, the more sloppy their efforts to catch you become, which is equally disappointing and jarring when you see them in the Outlaw missions where the pressure they apply borders to mission failure, which makes the stakes even more dangerous and more fun as a result. I've also encountered some bugs, two big ones actually, which one of them actually allowed me to progress through a race where the driver wasn't even driving with me, and funnily enough, it was the only one I was struggling with the most. The timer was all messed up as well, but crossing the finish line did still treat it as a regular race, which gave me a weird feeling. The second bug was in the final race, where I crashed my car so hard the game just soft locked on me, and I couldn't progress forward. At this point it was 3am, my fourth try in this 9 minute run, and I just called it quits for the day, as it quite literally pissed me off and I was running out of patience.
The biggest stinker of this entire package, however, is the always online requirement for the game, and I genuinely despise single player games that have an always online connection. Not just for a group of people who don't have the means to have a stable internet connection 24 7 or any connection at all, but also the inevitability of the servers one day shutting down and not being possible to play the game. Not just that, but your saves are stored on those servers, so you can say goodbye to them when the day comes, unless it gets patched to be played offline at some point, which is highly unlikely. Hey! Makai-san! Koei desu! Thank you. You're the master of the master builder. Thank you. Yo, I'm a Spike. So, no more. He's the guy who's the guy. <laughs> what do you say about me? Huh? Shut up, Spike. Say what you will about the story, but I really like it in a it's so bad that it's so good kind of way. The overall tone is purely childish and edgy, like those B movies where the dialogue overshines the plot. Each character is weirdly endearing as they try to personify this cool attitude while you can really tell that it's very forced and some of the interactions end up feeling unnatural and bizarre like the overuse of the word hashtag and first person fist bumps. Hashtag risky devil, hashtag best night ever. <laughs> best until next time. Until next time. Next time. Yeah. I also like how the icons in the game are actual real world people associated with car culture and I just can't imagine how they got wrapped up in this project like Magnus Walker, Akira Nakai and the late Ken Block. I mean I like tacos and all but I got my team, some cars in town, okay. I'd rather have a little fun than eat tacos. Right, right, right. You in? The usage of live action footage for cutscene is also a choice I'm really down with. It's hard to tell whether the development budget didn't allow for in-engine cutscenes or not, but still, this choice fits really well with the overall aesthetic the game has, and it further enhances that really cheesy approach of the narrative. Other than that, I don't have much to say about it, as I really wasn't paying that much attention and was only watching the cutscenes for the vibes. One thing I can point out is how as you further progress through the narrative, Spike, who introduced you to the group, starts getting really jealous of your achievements, and the actor who portrays him, plus the script itself, do this really awkward job of showcasing that, and when the climax hits, they just call it off in the most unnatural way possible, which for some reason left me dumbfounded. The way I'd do it, it would be in that same cutscene have him still pissed off and storm out of the building, but a couple of races later he calls you, hoping to talk to you physically and then a new cutscene plays out where he acknowledges he was being childish and apologizes for realizing he was in the wrong for his behavior, which would have been more natural. Weird tangent for a story that mostly doesn't take itself too seriously, but some heart wouldn't hurt, you know? Everybody loves an outlaw, someone fighting against the system. So you gotta ask yourself, are you the kind of driver who's in it for the rush? Or are you just someone who needs the attention? Even with all of that said, I still really enjoy the game, and I'm glad to have revisited in some way. It feels like finally closing a chapter on a book I left open years ago and never came back to. I'm also glad I developed a newer taste for it, as most of my admiration came through the art style, but now I can see the game for what it is, so goodbye it is to this, but I won't stop here, as I'm also planning on playing the other entries until I'm bound and eventually talk about them when, when I can, and I'm very excited for when those days come. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe, share with your friends and activate the bell, so you can get notification on my latest video, and thank you for watching.